we are live. So Mrs. Romano, take it away. Hi everyone. It is the Board of Ed Teaching and Learning Committee, uh, Learning Committee meeting. Special notice about procedures for this electronic meeting pursuant to the governor's executive order 7B. There will not be a physical location for this meeting. This meeting will be held electronically and live streamed on the Shelton Public Schools YouTube channel. The link to the live stream will be published on our district website and Facebook page immediately prior to the start of this meeting. The meeting agenda and minutes will be available at sheltonpublicschools.org. I now call the teaching and learning committee meeting to order. It is 4.31 p.m. Can I get a roll call, please? Yes. Amy Romano. Here. Carl Rizzo. Here. Kate Kutash. Here. Patty Moonen. Here. Kathy Yolish. Here. Also in attendance, Superintendent Karen Serenich, Director of Teaching and Learning, Kristen Santilli, and Supervisor of Chris Teaching and Learning, Tina Xavier. And I got everybody. Okay. Okay. Can we stand for the pledge of allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, I need a motion to approve the April 6th meeting agenda. Uh, I'll make a motion to approve the April 6th meeting agenda. Uh, Patty uh, Moonen. Carl Rizzo, second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, no opposed. I need a motion to approve the March 9th, 2021 meeting minutes. So uh, we'll I'll make a motion to. Go ahead. Thank you. Patty Moonen. I'll second it. Kate, okay. Okay. Kate Kutash and then Patty with the second. Yeah. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 No opposed. Okay. Moving on. Uh, so the agenda items today, the first item on the agenda is a professional development review. And um, I'm going to turn over to Mrs. Santilli, our director of uh, curriculum instruction, and she will start us off. Actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn it to um, Superintendent Serenich, and then he will hand it back over to oh, me. Okay, that's fine. So for today's teaching and learning meeting, we have two agenda items that we've kind of flowed into the same presentation so that it could just be continuous. Um, it, it'll it'll start with uh, Ms. Santilli's review of what we've done in professional learning this past month, um, as indicated in our school calendar, where we have those uh, early dismissal days for students. Uh, we take advantage of that with our staff by providing them their professional development needs. And Kristen's going to do a rundown of that. And then we're going to transition where uh, Ms. Xavier will give us uh, update and um, just some working knowledge about the Smarter Balance Assessment, which is underway in our schools as well. It's been two years since we've done the Smarter Balance Assessment. Last year, it was suspended uh, statewide due to the pandemic, so it is back. So I think this is a perfect time um, to remind our board, uh, this particular subcommittee, about what it means to take the Smarter Balance Assessment, what are our students being assessed on, uh, and in terms of um, why we do that assessment and how some things have slightly changed uh, since the last time we saw it two years ago. But before we begin, I just want to basically, um, as, as the presentation will flow from Kristen uh, into Tina, um, I want to just speak briefly about the Smarter Balance Assessment. Um, the Smarter Balance Assessment is done, you know, in administering on, on a team level approach. Uh, basically at the district, we have our district level team testing team. Uh, I am listed as the district testing coordinator for the entire district which means I am the point person to communicate with the state of Connecticut regarding the testing and administration that happens um, at the district level. And then we disseminate different roles within um, our district level team in which Kristen and Tina play key components to that out of the Office of Teaching and Learning. Tara Raposo also has a major component um, in the team at the district level, um, facilitating all the accommodations that are given to our students um, with IEP needs or any kind of accommodations that are delivered during the assessment piece. Um, and as well, we have the tech aspect um, where Glenn through his staff, uh, because as Tina is gonna explain to you, 
uh, the smart balance assessment is done through the computer. So an essential piece as to why, in, in light of budget, why it's appropriate that we need those one-to-one -one devices. Um, research has shown and demonstrated that the more proficient students can be uh, on, on the laptop and the more they use it, um, the better they will perform on assessments related to it. Because if we're giving students those laptops the day of the test, you know, it's going to make, there's going to be challenges just in the usage of the laptop than what it's actually supposed to be used for, which is to assess their content knowledge. So um, I'm very uh, appreciative of the work that this board has done and boards in the past to, to continually grow that one-to-one -one, um, for our district. I'm looking forward to next year, utilizing the ESSER two funding to be able to bring um, one-to-ones to our lower grades. And that should have a significant impact on our performance uh, and assessments in the future. With that being said, I'm gonna turn it back to Ms. Santilli where she can review um, the professional learning and then we'll close out with Smarter Balance Assessment. Okay, can you see the screen? Yes. yes. Okay. So the first topic that we have today is the March um, 2021 professional learning. There were four sessions, two um, half day sessions that were two hour sessions for K through four and then two two hour sessions for five through 12. They were building based. There were, um, you can see that there are some topics up on the screen that shows you what pre-K was working on and what some of the K to four teachers were working on. One um, item that was uh, necessary from the state was the um, foundations of reading survey. That's something that we have to take every few years for teachers in grades K through three. So one of the days was provided for, uh, for that um, as well as um, other other district initiatives that schools felt that they really needed or wanted to utilize the time for it, um, such as distance learning best instructional practices, uh, teachers having that time to to craft their uh, instruction with the distance learners, utilizing the technology available, coding, um, the Connecticut physical fitness test preparation and strategies. Um, the uh, math priority standards, as we know, we looked at the, the, the scores at the last meeting and math is definitely an area that we're really trying to um, focus and work on as well as special education. Again, in grades five through 12, you'll see some of the same topics that were, that were focused on the distance learning that, that, that was really of our utmost, uh, one of the most important areas that we provided PL on. Panorama, the social emotional learning, uh, and curriculum overview and revisions. What I think is very important to share is while these were building based PL times, I asked for feedback from teachers and administration and um, I, I got some really great feedback such as it was a great opportunity for department members to get together and share resources. We were finally able to dive into Panorama and plan for increased usage in future months. Um, teachers work with the reading consultant and math specialists to go over the units that are left to teach, how to prioritize, and how to continue to use NWEA reports as well as other assessments to address the needs of their students. Teachers found this time very beneficial as they were able to see what students need to be taught by the end of the year. We had a presenter from Wit and Wisdom give an overview and a presenter from Eureka Math Squared present an over overview. Both were outstanding and great introductions to hopefully what might be coming. I like being able to choose what fits our building best. The teachers appreciated the time to explore the panorama and work with other coaches to refine their small group instruction. So you can see that clearly um, it, the time that we, we allow them is, is very effective as well as uh, they're appreciative for the time and they're also appreciative that, you know, it's not just this is what you're doing. The district is saying always, you know, you have to do this. It's, you know, the, the administration and the teachers, you know, we, 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 we really make sure that we hear their needs and hear their voices when planning this PL so it is, you know, that much more meaningful. Okay, so now we're going to this slide I'm turning over to Miss Xavier. This is about SBAC. Okay, thank you, Kristen. But 
Mrs. Santelli, just yes. before we get, because I know the, the remainder slides are about SBAC. <coughs> Excuse me, maybe we should <coughs> entertain if there's any questions regarding the professional learning before we move topics. Sure. <coughs> Um, Kristen, could you go back to that first slide? So you guys did work on, I just saw that and I just wanted to, I wanted to make sure I read that right. We did special ed for the Orton Gillingham because I knew that was like a big one that um, they were asking for. So I saw yes. that, oh yes, it was, it was on there. Good, I'm glad. And they really looked at specifically the online version of Orton Gillingham because they've really had to utilize that more than ever with COVID. I knew that was like a big need for us is what I've heard. Yes. And that's been an area um, in the district that we've been working on since, since I began in, in July because we actually sent some teachers to get training in the program to, to build our capacity. And that's always the goal. What is Art in Gillingham? It is a... Uh, reading decoding program that is utilized with our uh, many of our students that have a reading disability or dyslexia and it is a very scripted research-based program it's um you know so many minutes a day it's very prescribed it's it it does a lot of um you know with the phonics and the in the word work and the um you know it, it's a, just a, a very um scripted approach and it's done in either one-on-one -on -one or in small group in order to, to teach those those kiddos that have a learning disability how to read. But I, I, I believe there was something about that particular um, thing. I just remember talking about it in the past, Kate, too, and I could be right or wrong, that I believe if we train them using this, it would also help us with funding, you know, because if we train our staff, we don't need it to use it elsewhere and keeping our staff trained versus paying someone else to do it. I believe with this certain program, I just remember that I could be wrong, but. Well, Orton Gillingham takes a special certification. So if people are going right, to. So if we're they, certified, then it helps us. They, yes, they, so they have to, they have to go through training that we have to pay for to certify them to do Orton Gillingham. Um, and then we do professional learning to kind of keep up the people who are associated with that. Um, but any kind of Orton Gillingham training would be facilitated outside of the district um, by one of our RESCs to certify a teacher in doing that. So this keeps this, those students in the school district and not having to go to a different school to be able to do this. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and to, to know when the students get this decoding uh, we call it decoding when they put it on the IEP, it is in addition to their literacy block or their English class. It is, okay. it is a double dip. Uh -huh. Kristen? Yes. I have a question. Um, okay, this, um, the 2021 professional learning schedule, is, is this going to be built upon for the next um, then the next professional learning or are the next ones just gonna be solely focused on any new programs we have? So professional learning, you know, it's not just, you know, these these four hours that we, we were able to provide schools. And, you uh -huh. know, during faculty meeting time, I used to use that as a professional learning time rather than going through housekeeping. So principals can follow through in that manner as well during their faculty meeting time. Um, and, and so on and so forth. The next, you know, district professional learning days uh, will not be until teachers return in the fall. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. So there, so some of these, some of these might overlap into that, into those days as well. Yes. Or they may. Yes. Okay. They may. Okay. And, and Kathy, if I can add, um, I know you're you're aware th this was a very dynamic year. It, uh, we had a lot of professional development offerings for our staff based on the state lessening the, the state requirement of number of days students need to be in school. So if you remember, the beginning of the year started off with 
five professional development days, which we never had before. But a lot of that practice was focused on, you know, perfecting uh, our, our talent in, in distance learning and that instruction and the technology upgrades that we had. So um, I'm, I'm very proud of the progress that our school district has made in that area. Uh, we definitely want to keep refining our skills over time, but next year we may have a dynamic shift relative to what this year brought because of the results of the pandemic reflective to our professional learning. You know, I, I did have a question for Kristen, more, more of a comment and a question in, in regards to distance learning and the best practices um, and kind of in conjunction with what you were saying, instead of, I know you have formal training, but also I'm wondering how much of that knowledge is shared amongst the staff, like informally or discussion database, all on an ongoing basis, because this is something that you know, changes all the time and Google comes out with new features and, and would be a real challenge to stay on top of. But I think if teachers were sharing their best practices on a you know, regular basis, uh, is that something that goes on, Kristen? So that did happen, that did occur. We did have uh, one department at the high school, the English department, they chose, they really felt their department wanted to focus on Cami this last time. So one teacher in the department presented all that she was doing with Cami, and then others, if they did it, they, they, they shared what they're doing. I also know in the science department, they focused specifically on, uh, one of them was on science labs, yeah. and they all talked about how they were doing those virtually and sharing of ideas so that um, teachers can get uh, get ideas. I will tell you, prior to COVID, as, a, as an elementary principal, I would sometimes give a faculty meeting and talk mm -hmm. about an a, instructional initiative. So say, let it be reading or math and say, okay, now I want you to go do a gallery walk around the building, go in other teacher's rooms and see what you see to get right. some ideas. Right. So right. things like that, you know, are very, are encouraged prior to the pandemic, but even now more so than, than ever the push is looking at let's share virtual let's share the remote and the virtual in the technology because that's really where teachers have had a huge learning curve i love it and and i just think back to the pilot that you guys did with the just the cameras uh, we could extend that and maybe do another similar pilot with you know touch screen devices that are coming or or yeah. whatever the new you know, new curriculum or new things are, and you could have maybe experts or, or um, best practices going on in each school or at each level, similar to the pilot, because that pilot was very successful. I agree with you. And I think that, I think we know now that the way we teach will never go back to the way it was. We yeah. may go back to the way it was in person, but our teaching has changed and our practices have uh, improved. And I think the use of technology um, is now no longer just using a Promethean board in a classroom or a, or a student on a Chromebook. I think the way we're delivering our instruction, I don't see these things going away, even when we are, you know, fully back. No, not at all. Right? I agree. Yeah. Mr. Rizzo, I'll make you this guaranteed promise that if, if you see that all the teachers get new touchscreen devices in their classroom, <laughs> I guarantee we'll do professional learning for every single one of them. Well, I'd love to see that. Kid. I'd love to see it. Yeah, I'll I put you on that committee. <laughs> That'd be awesome. I really do. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Sign me up. Okay. Okay, so S back. Okay, hi everyone. Okay, so the main focus for this part of the presentation is just giving you a general overview of what um, state assessments are. In addition to SBAC, there are a couple of other ones as well. Um, and also how we are going to administer the test for Shelton Public Schools. So SBAC um, is typically the, the term that's used and it's administered annually to all of our students and the state does expect a 95 um, participation rate. And SBAC is just one of the assessments that's given. And the SBAC is given for um, to assess students' skills and their content knowledge in math and ELA, and that's administered in grades um, three through eight. For science, um, the assessment that's used is called the Next Generation Science Standards. That's what S NGSS stands for. And this is actually the second time that um, we're actually taking it where um, the scores count for accountability uh, for the state of Connecticut. And that's administered in grades five, eight, and 11. 
And um, the SAT is what the state uses as its state mandated high school assessment. And that's administered in grade 11. And while these assessments um, are mandated, they do provide very important information um, to school districts. Um, first and foremost is that these assessments are used to ensure that we have academic growth for all of our students. And so whether you have your highest performing student or your lowest performing students, we are accountable to ensure that all students are showing growth in their learning. And also um, these assessments help to ensure that we are preparing our students for the next stage of their life post high school so that they are ready to be successful, whether it be college or enter the workforce. Um, also why these tests are very important. It's not just because the state mandates that we have to take it, but it also provides us very targeted information about where our students are, where they're going and where we should put our resources to really drive instruction at both the district level and the building level. So this information is used to really um, create our district and our school um, goals. Okay, Kristen. Okay, so what is SBAC and NGSS? Um, SBAC stands for Smarter Balanced Assessment Consortium. And then there is the CAT, the com it is a computer adaptive test. As the student takes the test, the difficulty of the questions adjusts or adapts depending on the student answer. It gives us a better picture of what students know and can do. Performance tasks provide an opportunity for students to integrate knowledge and skills across multiple standards. Um, performance tasks provide multiple sources of data. It, this includes readings, video clips, data, and problem solving scenarios. Questions measure the depth and breadth of career and college readiness skills, research and writing skills, complex problem solving, and mathematical reasoning. With the, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say with the performance task, that's really where we're looking at that transfer of learning, where you're really going to have that authentic learning. So it's not just an, a matter of answering a multiple choice question where you can be where you can guess. These performance tasks really um, drill down to what a student really knows and what they're able to do. So it's really taking it to that next level. The test items are uh, multiple choice, multi select items, meaning more than one answer. Um, tables, hot text, meaning highlighted word or sentence in a text, graphing items, short answer items, and extended responses and essays. Um, it, it's important to know that it was developed by teachers for test items, item review. This includes teachers with experience working with special education and EL students, and it also allows for making sure items are accessible and equitable for students with a wide variety of backgrounds and needs. Tina, do you want to speak to the NGSS? Sure. Okay, so the next generation science standards assessment questions. These are, um, first of all, we just adopted these standards in 2015. And as I said, it's, it's only administered in three grades, grades five, eight, and grade 11. And they are looking to assess student understanding in three disciplines. So it's life, earth, and physical science. And um, there's the standalone items which test for content knowledge, but then there's also these uh, cluster items which really um, have students look at these phenomena-based real life science application. And again, it's, it's that opportunity to show that deeper understanding. Um, to go back to what Kristen said, I served on the advisory committee that actually looks at those assessment items. And that's, really, that's a really important part before the assessment um, questions are put out there, they're field tested and teachers actually go in, look at these questions to make sure that they're appropriate, grade level appropriate, they're aligned with the standards and that they also don't feel biased. Um, so that's very important as well. So that to make sure that every student, you know, has a fair chance of doing well without, um, you know, any bias in their, you know, what they bring to the table. Okay, so how do we prepare for SBAC in Shelton? Um, the students are exposed to taking the practice test, which uh, exposes them to the types of questions, tools, and format of the test. Uh, this year, we are implementing the IABs or interim assessment blocks. Um, it's assess they are online assessments teachers can use throughout the school year to assess smaller bundles of content. They are intended to provide um, teachers and students the ability to check where they are at at that moment in time and educators can use results to determine the next steps for instruction with that individually with that student. 
And um, the nice thing, if I can just chime in, Kristen, with the IABs, is that it really gives a, a students an opportunity to kind of practice with the tools and be able to view what the real assessment's going to look like. So it's, again, it's, it's, it's an opportunity for um, teachers and students to be, become familiar with the test items. I use those the last two years I taught, and they're really great because the kids get used to what they're looking at, and, yes. and you can answer, help them yep. figure out how to answer when you can't do it on the test. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, accessibility resources are available. They are universal, so we can identify and assi assign the necessary supports for testing um, with individual supports. So, for example, if there's an EL student and they need a glossary, um, et cetera. Designated supports um, are additional supports to students to ensure that assessments provide the greatest opportunity to meet the needs of all students, specifically students um, with disabilities um, or who are, um, you know, our, our EL population or students with um, in tiered intervention. And the nice thing about the designated supports is that, as Kristen says, it ensures accessibility. So, um, you know, a, a student let's say they're doing math and they're not strong in reading, well, they shouldn't be penalized for not being able to read well. So then a teacher can turn on through a group of teachers and they decide what designated supports should be turned on, you know, that won't impede their um, ability to answer the math questions because the math is not an assessment for reading, it's to show your understanding of, of math. And so the designated supports really allow students to have, um, you know, fair access to the assessment items. Kristen, can I make a comment before you switch the slides? Of course. Um, I just, you know, when we're talking about preparing for the, the Smarter Balance Assessment, if, if you would all pay attention to um, the graph that's here, you'll notice that there's an arrow cutting through the graph. And the beginning of the arrow starts with state standards. I think the, the really aspect here that really starts with how do we perform well on the Smarter Balance? It's not about the practice test, the IBs. These are all tools to get our students prepared on this type of environment of testing. It all starts with curriculum writing, you mm -hmm. know, to be able to align our curriculum to state and national standards mm -hmm. is then we know that they will be tested on the content knowledge that we're delivering in the classroom, because it's not about teaching to this test. It's about assessing what students know. So um, a really key aspect, especially as we present in the teaching and learning subcommittee today is always the reminder of how good and strong curriculum writing is the basis for student knowledge. And that, that's where it really begins. Thank you. And, and to Ken's point, and it's a wonderful point, um, like when we showed you the NWEA, and then I was just on a call with Lexia today, the, um, those programs are directly correlated to how a, a student will perform on the SBAC. So they, they provide us with not only the data, but also, okay, this is what this student needs. These are the lessons that you need to do with this student. And both programs provide those, uh, those tools. So it is our, we are really looking at the curriculum, as Ken said, that's just one example of, of how the curriculum, you know, we try to connect it. Okay, the testing window. So the district testing window it will be from April 1st to May 14th. School testing windows range from two to four weeks, depending on the size of the school, depending on um, how many assessments they have to take, like Tina shared with you, uh, grades five and eight have to do reading, math, and science. So they, that's going to take a little longer. And then after you know they're, they're done with the two to four weeks, that's when there's time for makeup sessions. And they usually try to only give one test a day. Um, they, they don't test all day long in the schools. Some schools don't test on Fridays. They have that as one of their makeup days and uh, they don't test for more than two hours a day. Okay, so um, the next slide has to do with the state's um, current status on assessment. Um, so prior to our training, um, our school district um, school testing teams, we went to a training, um, the administrative team here, and health and safety remains to be, remains the state's number one priority. So making sure that our teachers and our students are safe and healthy and that it's safe to administer the assessment. 
Um, with that said, um, the state is committed to administering the assessments this year to the fullest extent. And um, the state has applied for a federal waiver for participation and accountability, but we um, have not heard if that has been granted. So we are moving forward. Um, and again, it's important that we, we didn't have testing last year, so we don't really have baseline data. So it's in, important that we do administer um, the test this year um, in that it's gonna provide um, long-term trends in, in terms to be able to see what would be the effect of learning loss as a result to um, COVID, um, be able to evaluate the full impact of the pandemic on student achievement and growth. And then also very importantly, it will provide us information in terms of where do we put our money in terms of um, support and resources um, to make sure that they are most wisely spent. And again, um, having the assessment done this year is gonna help the state reset our growth measure as we move forward with um, our accountability index in um, the following school year. So Tina, I'm just gonna in interrupt and add on to what you were saying. So um, to Tina's point, you know, and I know we talked about the, the educational aspect of why we deliver the test to assess student knowledge and growth. You know, we are required um, in the state of Connecticut to administer this test in all districts. That is part of the Federal Accountability Act. You know, the federal government, you know, um, instituted a, 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 an Educational Student Assessment Act in which every state determines how they're going to assess students in the state of Connecticut. It is through the Smarter Balance Assessment. So we're required through federal, through federal funding that we have to administer this test. All right. With that being said, as part of the administration of the test is also um, the idea of accountability and posting the scores, as I'm sure board members and our public are aware of in years past where all the scores are posted on our performance and others uh, relative to the assessment. Um, this year, because of the pandemic last year, there has a petition that has been placed by the state of Connecticut to the federal government asking them to waive um, the posting of the performance of this year's assessment. So it'll solely be used, as Tina said, to measure student growth in a year's time. We have yet to hear you know, the, the, the state of Connecticut is still filing it. In an ironic twist of events, you know, Miguel Cordonia put forth this petition to the federal government and then ended up receiving it on the opposite end when he got appointed to D.C. So um, we're waiting for him to make a decision on his proposal um, and how that would turn out for Connecticut relative to um, in, in speaking to the people at the State Department, they feel very promising that, that that would pass. We just have not heard the official word. Um, and I think for all parties interested, especially our students and our teachers, you know, we want to get back into the habit of administering these tests so we can measure growth with it and align our curriculum and align our assessments with it without the political pressures of performance. We know that there's been um, sliding. You know, we talk about the COVID slide in terms of the gaps that were created um, with the shutdown that took place in the state and the world. So just getting us back to a rather regular normal routine and taking the assessment under the conditions we have to do, and then using that data to assess um, where we need to go with our instruction in the fall um, would be optimal for us. Thank you. Okay, so the next slide has to do with how we plan to administer the test um, in Shelton. Um, so again, this began way back in January where we went through some initial training um, with the state and then we delivered that presentation to our school testing teams. And from there, the schools developed their testing calendars which they shared with the Office of Teaching and Learning. The goal is to have as many of our students take the test in person. Um, so you know, once, once the students return back to school, you know, and most of the schools have already started their testing is to really administer the test um, in person. We are also um, going to offer for our fully remote learners. We are working with the schools to schedule um, in-person testing here at central office, um, working with, with the schools to administer that. And on that very rare occasion where we need to administer remotely, the, stool, uh, the state has um, developed a remote proctoring tool, which has been uh, practiced in some of the schools. So we do know that it works. We will then offer that opportunity to students who can't come in person or take the test in an alternative um, secure uh, district location. So if you look at the diagram, that's the state's um, hierarchy. And you can see the re, um, it's an upside down pyramid, but they really do expect that most of the students will be taking the assessment in person. 
So. How are we dealing with getting the students to central office? Because a lot of parents are back working in person and I know the testing takes place daily. That can be quite a burden. So, and so I, that would only be for our remote learners as it is. Right. So um, my, my general question would be, if the student is at home receiving learning, who's watching the student while they're at home? So I would right. imagine we're not leaving our young children um, at home alone. So there should be somebody who would be able to bring them to central office um, when we're test. We're, we're, and it's gonna be systematic. It's not gonna be, hey, can you bring your child to central office tomorrow? They'll know way in advance. So for planning purposes, they can make arrangements and get that child here um, for the testing dates. Yeah, that makes sense. I didn't think it all the way through to the end, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? And, and, and that was a move that we did, not only because, again, we're, we're utilizing the space that we have here in central office with the new boardroom um, to, to utilize the testing center, but with going back to full in-person learning this week, because tomorrow will be the first day that all of our um, seventh through 12th grade students are, are back in school, uh, the schools no longer have that flexibility or time to, to try to administer testing for our distance learners. So we, we teamed here at Central Office um, to figure out how we can do that and, and accommodate their needs by bringing them here and testing them on site here would be the best situation. We get our scores back in August, correct? It's like the summer? We get them back in the summer. We, we haven't been given a de determined date when those scores would be back. Normally though, yeah. right? Yep. Yep. So we would look at them in the fall as a group. Right. Yep. yep. Okay. Any questions on SBAC? I know that the schools are starting. There's kids there are taking them for the past couple of days. Back to the grind. Anyone else have any questions? Nope. Okay. Um, I just had questions of did we practice, but we already talked about that, the scores. Oh, and, and even though this is not SBAC, but while we were on it, when are we taking the spring NWEA? After the SBAC. After the SBAC. So it will be like May? May. After May, like late May. Yeah. Okay, late May. Late May. Okay. I knew it was something. Okay. All right. If anyone, if we don't have any other questions, then um, that was the second item on the agenda. They were basically merged together. Um, and then the third item is the technology audit, which I know is they finished the in-house audit, but not sure of the so that, As Mr. we've Harris, reported out yes. at, at past meetings, we're, we're waiting for that written report. Um, as of yesterday, Glenn Newman, the tech director, spoke to the company who's doing the report. Uh, they have guaranteed to us that we will have that report in hand no later than April 15th. So between now and April 15th, we will have that. So, so um, we, are, we, we already discussed the reasons why that report was delayed, but now... Um, there's a certain point where the, the company themselves knows the accountability for the business that they that they had at hand. And they said by next week, we, so pretty much a week from today, we'll have that report. So okay. we'll be able to report out on it. And again, it, there, I know there's many multitude aspects that this report reflects on with this committee and also finance. Um, I know finance is next. So I don't know if uh, my, my yeah. idea is when that report comes in, we reconvene the subcommittee of this group, which would be the tech group of Patty and yeah. Carl uh, with Glenn and I to kind of review that, maybe reporting it out at finance and then doing a follow-up at the next teaching and learning. Right, that's what I was just gonna say, How the timing of it, yeah. how do we want to all see yeah, it? That, that's how you know. That's how we want to do it. I know, I know there's a lot of interested parties uh, that want to know the results of the tech, not only from our own board of ed, but even right. speaking with you know, John Anglace last week, he wants to know about where we stand with the tech audit and how the city can support it. So we're going to get that information out as quickly as possible. Well, if Patty, if you wanted to do something with Patty and Carl when you got it in, because you're working behind the scenes, then maybe you could even just do a Carl or Patty could send an email to us just to give us like an overview of what it said, right? And then so yeah. we're 
so that we could also support it in finance. So if we're going to discuss it in finance, at least our committee members here aren't blind to what it says. And it's like, oh, it's the first time we ever saw it. No, right? it, it, so is, it is my intent. It. it is my intent to at least have some kind of synopsis of the report right. to present at the finance committee. And then we saw it ahead of time and we could support it as a group yep. to finance and then discuss it again. Right. Sounds good to me, Ken. Great. So that's the report on where we are with the audit. Any other questions? Anyone? Anyone? <laughs> Last call. <laughs> okay, we're going to move on to superintendent's comments. Well, as as um, we just presented, and I said earlier, uh, I'm very proud of the work that our staff has done um, relative to professional learning. Uh, it, it really, you know, for us shows why Shelton shines in, in the way we do with instruction based on the professional needs we do for our staff and the growth and engagement that they have in it. We are in the throes of, of testing. Um, it always has its challenges with the technology component with it and making sure we have devices, making sure the internet doesn't cut out. You know, just the idea of um, our students haven't tested like this in, in over two years. So um, I'm really hoping that, that that federal waiver comes through so that it takes off the pressure of the results on the testing and we can really get back and dive into the business of teaching and learning, um, which is where the heart of the matter is. But what I did wanna just make sure that I um, brought up in my superintendent's report. So uh, as of yesterday, um, working with the, the ladies that I'm on screen with in the Office of Teaching and Learning, we updated uh, the distance learning plan and posted it on our website. So it is um, viewable on, on the center screen of our website to click on it. The updates um, really are reflected to the practices that will begin tomorrow. Um, whereas we are now eliminating the hybrid out of, there's no language in, in the distance learning plan relative to the hybrid because starting tomorrow, we're bringing our students back and then just finishing out this week. Um, very excited about that. Um, we, we obviously in the distance learning plan have to address distance learners because they will still be a component of for the remainder of the year um, and where we're doing and how we're meeting the needs of our distance learners um, for the remainder of the year through the classroom. And uh, not a lot of the components of the plan itself has changed more than just updating it to some of the language that's reflective and what we've learned throughout the year. Uh, but I encourage you know, staff um, students, parents, board members to feel free to click on that link, um, check out to see what the updates are um, based on the work of the committee. This, the, the new plan is in these nice, pretty little colors that have been added um, that I guess I didn't have before, but you know, you can see all the pretty colors in the distance learning plan. Um, and then if you have any questions, please feel free to direct it to the Office of Teaching and Learning or myself. And that's all I have to report. Ken, um... A lot of systems are noticing a spike in children in COVID. Are we still seeing few cases because we haven't heard from you? Uh, that is absolutely correct. We're seeing a, a, a definitely a spike. We're required to record um, cases. Uh, the cases that we have been receiving are, are students, um, not necessarily staff. We have seen a spike uh, recently in, in our student population. Um, many of it has not affected our school buildings because um, it's been either prior quarantining that has taken place because a family member within a household and they just reported about another family member that received it, or it's going on from our distance learners. But with that being said, this is a perfect opportunity for me to again stress to our community that, you know, COVID still does exist. We want everyone to continue to follow the mitigated strategies. You know, I know it's the weather's the sunshine and the positive weather's coming out and everyone thinks that we're going back to a sense of normal and people are getting vaccinated and all these things are good things, but we still want to remain safe. And um, if if you or your or anyone of one in your household are experiencing any COVID-like symptoms, um, please absolutely take the necessary time to self-quarantine, get a test if you have to, um, because the more people who bring a possible exposure into our school system, um, brings the potential of us closing down large areas of instruction. And we don't want to get into a situation where we're closing down classrooms, grade levels, or schools. So. Will you have the, um, I think you said May 1st was the deadline for all the distance learners to yep. decide if they were going to continue with distance learning for the rest of the school year, except for obviously if there was a yep. special opt out for quarantining or something. Um, would you give us an update on um, those 
the documents again, like, you know, how, how many distance learners are left for May and June? Absolutely. You know, like um, an updated We'll, we'll have a final update um, when that turns around. Um, as I said at the last board meeting, and, and again, it's always friendly reminders to everyone that um, we're, we're making that decision, of, decision effective May 1st for, you know, parents to make that, particularly yeah. coming off of April vacation, because if people are going away on vacation, the guidelines from the CDC and the state of Connecticut are to quarantine. So we want people to be able to do that self-quarantining to make sure people are safe instead of um, feeling the necessity to come back to school. So during that time frame, um, even if you intend to be an in-person learner for the remainder of the year, we support the idea that you'd have to quarantine because you're coming out of vacation and do remote learning for those last few weeks of April. Um, and then that time frame will be done and anyone who wants to be an in-person learner can come in. Um, through working with Adriana Collins, um, we are putting together a document that'll be sent out to, the, to all of our families by the end of the week, um, reminding them of all the travel um, guidelines, um, the quarantining guidelines, and um, what they would need to know if they're going on vacation before they return, as well as for our community, um, where we've listed all the opportunities for families who have children over the age of 16, how they would need and they can sign up for vaccinations for their families. So um, there are uh, many avenues to be able to get vaccinations and, and very quickly. Uh, I know firsthand of, of phone numbers that you can call and get, get appointments within a week's time, so. And not to get too much off topic, it was just going back to those class sizes again. Um, then maybe when you give that update, I don't, you know, I guess it depends. Maybe it, it could be a discussion for next month's, you know, teaching and learning, or, or at least it comes through our committee or something with class sizes, because this is going to now be, we're going back to class sizes. Everybody's going to be there seven through 12 and what they actually look like for the upper grades um, to, to see, because we only really always get to see K through six um, on our monthly reports. So we can maybe dive into the, the upper grades, especially going into the budget season um, on what those schools look like now that everybody's going back. And we still have concerns on a class size at the elementary level. Right. I still yeah. have someone asking but, me about the, it. Frequently. The upper grades concern me because, you know, we did make cuts there. And so we really haven't had a clear picture of what's been happening in those schools. And, but there's a lot of kids on those Google Meet pictures <laughs> on the screens. And there's a lot of numbers. So we want to, I'm sure, you know. And, and having the documentation is going to be key because we have to remember that, um, even a class that may have X number of students in there, there's families that still have options for, for distance learners. So there could be right. additional students yeah. who aren't present that, that have to go into the accounts. Right, uh, right. And we're looking at what it's gonna look like in the fall, um, if we go back to a sense of, of normal in terms of enrollment and where we go in, we truly need to look at, you know, to your point, Mrs. Romano, with the budget, um, adding, in person with the opt-outs for those classes to get the true numbers. Yep. Right, and get the true numbers. But yeah, so that's something that I guess we have to look at class sizes. Um, okay. And okay, so mine, trying to find my little notes here. Um, there's only two meetings left of the school year as I was digesting, thinking about things today. Um, May and June, but I do feel really good of what we've accomplished. Like I try to look back on what this committee has done and I feel really good of all the things that we've, that we have done and, and helped um, the team so far and supported them. And I do feel really good with the support staff that we have right now, the professional learning that we've done um, and the support system we have in place for the students. Um, and I do feel hopeful that our spring, you know, NWEA scores are going to, um, raise now that everybody is coming back they're going to increase and um, get these students back on track and i do see the teachers working really hard um on on doing that and i've seen a little bit of social emotional learning this week too already happening um i i get to see sometimes a sneak little peek being a parent so um i do see that happening and which is great and they were talking about kindness today and in the you know the elementary schools so it's it's um i like to see that that's constantly incorporated in there so i do feel really hopeful and good about everything that's happening in the schools um our next meeting is may 11th 
No. Uh, I know we've been sort of pushing off, so, off social emotional learning, but that will be hopefully a topic. We just had to push it um, because they wanted to actually come back to school, what they're doing now and do the social emotional learning and then and then now talk about it next month. Ken, you're raising your hand about that. Yeah, ju just a point of clarity, as we discussed on email, because we already um, kind of notified, um, we're, we pushed the May meeting to May 25th because oh, we'll have the data. We'll, well, we'll have the data then from the survey on social emotional learning because they're going to do the post survey mm -hmm. in the beginning oh. of May, and we want to be able to report that out at the May meeting. So oh, we're getting enough time to get yeah. the testing done. Nope, it's just I yeah. just want to clarify so that we. Yeah, know. I knew we were doing it with the social emotional learning, so yep. I just. And so we, we pushed it back to the twenty fifth. Twenty fifth. Okay, so then we have that data to go over and. Um, and then I guess the rest of the agenda items will take take it as we go. Maybe we'll be talking about audits. We'll be talking about all sorts of things. So, and that is about it. And then I guess I would consider this meeting adjourned. It's 520. Everyone enjoy the rest of their beautiful